Okay, good morning to all. Um, can you all hear me? Does this sound good? Just to get some feedback here, make sure we're connected. Great, thank you. Um, so looking forward to our time today, I'm going to just say ahead, uh, if it's possible, and this is great, um, just by audio is fine. If I could ask in a moment, Dan McAvoy, if you'd be willing to just pray for us uh, and give us a word of a couple of minutes just in prayer to introduce our class. And um, if you've got the mic to do that, great. Um, before we do that, though, let's just, uh, I'll just introduce Dr. Ward for the lecture that we have today. I'm excited about it. Uh, it is our last in the series of lectures that Dr. Ward has done for us. So uh, he is relieved greatly, I'm sure. Um, he's done an immense amount of work for us here, and I'm extremely grateful for his work. Uh, he's relieved to be able to sleep and uh, on a normal schedule at this point. So he's, like I said before, he's in a hard time zone and that's, uh, it just makes a difference on, on life. So anyway, this is our last lecture with him. Uh, there's a sense for me though, I'm disappointed to have the last lecture as I felt, felt the same way with Dr. Collins, uh, just because I've enjoyed the lectures with them so much. And I think what you're gonna sense here is basically this whole first part of the course has been between the two of them. They've carried, they've carried the first part of this course. So the nature of the course has been defined by their excellent teaching in this first half. Um, you're going to sense a change now. I'll be taking some lectures. Dr. Oberlin has some lectures. Uh, actually, I'm really excited to announce because this, is, this was not in our information before just because we couldn't put it up yet. Uh, but Pastor or Dr. Mark Minnick in Greenville, he'll be doing a lecture for us uh, towards the end of the course on hermeneutics and preaching. And that'll be, a, that'll be an excellent lecture as well. So we really have some great stuff coming up um, and I'm looking forward to all of them. Just finishing out today though with Dr. Ward's last lecture, uh, it's sort of a capstone for the different pieces that he's contributed here. And uh, I know that you've already expressed your thanks to him. Um, so anyway, we will look forward to what he has to share with us today in that. Uh, in the content that he's going to cover, can I just say, I'm sure he will as well, the book that we'll be going over in this content, it's a great buy. So I highly recommend it. Buy it, read it. It's not that long, really. Um, it's an excellent resource. It, it really helps shape the way you think about exegesis, helps you Let's say this, it helps caution you about the dangers that are there and helps really form you to be responsible in the way you do your exegesis. Okay, so I highly recommend, and I hope that you'll take the opportunity and jump at that if, if, if you can to pick up that resource. And then for our next lecture, uh, I'm looking forward to being with us on Thursday. We've got some good things to do there. It's the companion piece to what Dr. Collins did earlier. So he covered, he covered uh, poetry and then also wisdom literature, and I'll be covering the epistles and prophecy. Um, and he also did narrative, I'm sorry. So that'll be coming up on Thursday. You will have some assignments that I'll be putting up for that, and uh, that'll be up in the next 24 hours. So uh, grab those assignments, get through that reading, and we'll be looking forward to that lecture. Okay, if you have any questions or any problems, let me know. Uh, those of you that have paid or been able to send something in or been able to contact me about it, uh, that would be that would be kind of your confirmation of being credit status. Um, that's the way we know that you're credit status. So if you intend to and you've had any trouble, just let us know and we'll take care of that. Make sure that's all set up. Okay, uh, I will ask if, if I don't, I'm not sure if uh, he heard me or not, but if Dan McAvoy is on, we'll, we'll be happy to introduce the class with prayer and then we'll hand it over to Mark Ward. Sure, glad to pray, thank you. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we are grateful today for the opportunity, even through technology, to, uh, to study, to learn. Pray for your blessing on this class, on uh, Dr. Ward, Dr. Arnold, and then every student around the globe. Thank you for the fact that your work marches on and you have your men all over this planet, always have, always will. We thank you for that. Help us, Lord, to be well-trained, uh, skilled, experienced, growing to rightly divide your word so that you get all the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. Thank you, Pastor McAvoy. It's humbling to see some of the experienced pastors on here, and I hope that what we go over today will be valuable for you. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to do the reading in Carson's book, Exegetical Fallacies, yet, uh, but you most certainly should, and Dr. Arnold is correct that this book is highly worth your time. Um, I'm going to presume that you have read the uh, portion assigned and going to presume that you're going to read the whole book at some point in your lifetime, hopefully quite soon, because of its very high value. This is just one of those little instant classics that everybody who is who, who really desires to be responsible with their exegesis has got to get through and got to own and and got to reference occasionally. And <clears throat> I went back through some of the material myself uh, recently and was, again, deeply impressed by what Carson had to say. He's highly gifted, and he is a gift to the church. Um, I want to kind of add on to some things uh, that he said. That is, maybe start from some places where he laid a foundation, and I want to. Um, I don't know if I could say make some advances, but just offer some more reflections. <clears throat> and the first section of our lecture this morning, I want to help us think together about other Bible teachers' exegetical fallacies. So let's now think about the, the specs and the uh, and the logs in other Bible teachers' eyes, and that'll be a way into thinking about those in our own. And then later on, I want to expand greatly on a topic that Carson raises, namely the meaning of the Greek word agape. That's where I did my own dissertation work, <clears throat> and we'll be working directly from my dissertation. I'll be taking you some of the, through some of that material. But let's start with how to think about other Bible teachers' exegetical fallacies. <clears throat> Now, unless you are superhuman, you just cannot remember everything that you read. And I don't, and I can't say that I've ever set out purposely to memorize very much of what I've read beyond Scripture, of course. So who can say then why certain phrases from books have stuck out to me over the years and stuck out enough that I ended up encoding them in some brain cell somewhere, and I'm sure you are the same way. One of those statements that has just managed to work its way into my memory comes from Carson's book that I had you read, and it's from a portion I don't think I assigned to you. It's from the introduction, uh, page 22. He says, sustained negativism is highly calorific nourishment for pride. So we're here to talk about exegetical fallacies which means giving examples of bad things that other people have done with the Bible. So quick, utter with me a silent prayer antidote before we get into this topic. Lord, help me to be humble and to notice the logs in my own eye before I notice the specks in others or even the logs in others. Help me to continue to esteem other Bible teachers to be better than myself, even when my knowledge exceeds theirs. Amen. Your knowledge will always exceed that of at least some other Christians that you meet. Particularly if you're a pastor or other Bible teacher, I hope your knowledge exceeds uh, that of at least some other Christians that you're speaking to. And there are lots of anti-intellectual people in the Christian church over whom it is easy to feel pride. I recently ran across a KJV-only mission board with dozens of missionaries that misspelled King James Version in their doctrinal statement. Uh, to quote my, one of my favorite humor writers, Dave Barry, we are not making this up. And I put, a, I put a link in the notes. There was also the small Baptist college, which also happened to be King James only, whose doctrinal statement proclaimed its belief in the, quote, reprehensive and substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. Now, reprehensive is, is not a word. Um, that, uh, that I've ever heard, and I looked it up in the dictionary just in case, and no, it's not used. They kind of mixed up reprehensible, which means terrible, and uh, something that 
collects opprobrium and they mixed it with representative, which is the word they really meant. And I'm not making this up either. Now, we all do this kind of thing. It's called a malapropism. And there are other examples that you just, you know, if, if I do tend to make a misspelling in a document, it's because I do something like this, where I write a word that sounds like the word I meant. Like someone who says, he must have been deluded to think that he could win that basketball game, and they spell deluded, D-I-L-U-T-E-D, which is what, uh, which is what happens when you add a bunch of water into apple juice. Or do you believe in the five tenets of Calvinism? Uh, and they spell tenants, T-E-N-A-N-T-S. A tenant is a renter who lives in your apartment that you're renting out. What they meant was tenets, T-E-N-E-T-S from Latin, which means to hold something. We all do this. The other day in a very world-class publication that hires copy editors, I saw someone write the phrase, take it for grant it, instead of take it for granted. Generally, people have no trouble understanding what you mean when you write or speak a malapropism because they tend to rhyme with the words they displace and context makes quite clear what you, what you intend. And nobody really thought that this small Baptist college was saying that Jesus' sacrifice deserved censure and condemnation when they called it a reprehensive sacrifice. So as I said, we all do things like this but not usually in doctrinal statements where precise wording is the whole point. For someone to let such embarrassing errors into doctrinal statements suggests, well, it suggests that Christians are what we are. We're a group of people into which not many wise and not many noble are called, as 1 Corinthians 1 says. Let me read to you the paragraph in 1 Corinthians 1 that's relevant here. Paul says, consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. As it is written, let, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That is powerful. What is Paul saying? That one of the reasons for God's election of certain individuals is precisely that they are low and despised so that he gets even more glory. Not everybody who's elected is low and despised or of ignoble birth, or lacks power. God does choose some people like Paul, sends a light out of the sky, blinding him, and, uh, and causes him to become one of his servants. And Paul was highly educated, and we can be glad for that. But that's not, that's not the norm. The norm here is, in general, not many are wise or powerful or noble. And that command at the end of the paragraph I read, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord, that one is written for the weak and the strong alike. It's written for the uneducated and the educated alike. All our boasting ought to be in the Lord. Boasting in the Lord is the solution to the temptation to boasting in anything else like advanced education. So let me boast in him. Every insight I have into the Bible, such as it is, and into accurate interpretation of it, is a gift of grace, divine grace. The will to study that I've had, at least at times throughout my entire life, is also a gift. The opportunity for education is a gift. The blood flow necessary to type is all gift, every last corpuscle. I remember speaking to one of the oddest people that ever came to my church in Greenville. He was an atheist, and he came to our church for a good 10 or more years. Boy, how long was it? Yeah, you know, he's been there 16 years now. I believe he's still there. And for at least 10 or 12 of those years, he came as an atheist. 
And I would ask him, why did you, why did you come? We'd love to have you, but you know, you, you tell me openly, you don't believe this stuff. Why are you here? He said, well, I like to be around nice people. One time I was talking with him at his place of work and I was complaining a little bit about some of the deficiencies in my education. Um, some things that I wish I'd learned that I thought I should have learned that I didn't. And he said, wait a minute, you, you uh, were given a job at the school so that your education would be paid for. You are extremely lucky. And this guy who at the time wasn't even a Christian taught me a big lesson. Um, and from that moment to this, I have sought to remember always to boast in the Lord and be grateful for whatever I received uh, and not complain about it. Now, I'm not done thinking about how to think about other people's errors before we talk about them, because I've been thinking a lot about it. And I believe that when a hobby horse has proven its worth, you should just keep on riding it for a little while. And this is an awkward topic, but we need to talk about it because it's in the Bible, the re here in 1 Corinthians and especially. The reality is that some Christians will never get the words imminent, immanent, and eminent straight. Imminent being something that's just about to happen. Immanent being um, like God's presence. It's, it's here. It's with us it's rather than transcendent. And eminent is like something high-ranking, uh, like a king, something noble. Imminent, eminent, and imminent. God called these people knowing full well that their educational opportunities were limited. He delights to use the weak to shame the strong. And he gave them other gifts. And that's a reason that we should be humble. If God delights to use the weak to shame the strong, why would we, who are strong, if you're sitting here listening to an advanced lecture and you can follow it, then you're one of the strong. You're somebody who might have a reason to boast in your strength, but you shouldn't. You don't want to be the object of God's um, chastening, even, even now as a Christian. Um, if you are blessed with God with the years of education and the personal inclination necessary to keep commonly confused words fully distinct in your mind, like affect and effect, nauseated and nauseous, lie and lay, then use your gifts for God's glory. And I'm presuming I'm speaking to mostly pastors and future pastors here. If you have people in your church who are anti-intellectual, <clears throat> don't let them off the hook either. They need to know that, um, that God gifts different people in the body differently. So don't let the dictionary say to the auto repair manual or the farmer's almanac or the cookbook, I have no need of you. Um, and don't let it go the other way either. If you see people sinning in that way, um, encourage them to recognize that, no, uh, not everybody has to have the advanced education that a pastor hopefully does have. Um, but we need each other's gifts. If you don't have the educational gifts and opportunities, then ask for help when writing doctrinal statements. And if you do, be humble toward those who don't. So the right way to think about your own exegetical fallacies and those of others is often, I find, to think of your God-given places within the body of Christ. <clears throat> this is, of course, a major New Testament metaphor. You've got the hands and the feet and um, the eyes who are not supposed to say to each other, we don't need you. The pastor who cannot seem to exegete, exegete his way out of a paper bag might be very fruitful in evangelism. The pastor who constantly rubs you the wrong way in his Bible interpretation may be a very loving provider of pastoral care. And if you come to see that a sermon you preached or an article that you wrote was simply erroneous, as years pass and your education improves, take a little comfort. Take comfort in the fact that God let you see the error. That's a grace of his. The upshot of what I'm saying is be humble in every area of life, except for one major boast, boast in the Lord. And if you ever need any humbling, do something that I do. Read D.A. Carson. He's so much smarter, smarter than you and me that it's like taking a humble pill to read anything that he writes. We're, and we're going to travel through um, some exegetical fallacies today and some material that was uh, in significant part generated uh, by Carson's work.
Now we've got a, a uh, comment here from Reverend Zanthan Leon. I found reading fascinating, put a, but a bit confused about with Hapax Legomena, words that appear only once. Also found that there are many words appear in biblical words in Hebrew, which word might be theologically significant as an example. Okay, a Hapax Legomenon that might be significant. Um, I cannot come up with one on the spot, but I'm going to keep that in the back of my head as I talk, and we might might have one. Um, but in fact, the word that we're going to talk about, although it's not a hopox, it has some um, some some overlap with that concept uh, uh, because the whole problem with the hopox is that it appears only once, and therefore there isn't sufficient usage outside the New Testament or the Old Testament, as the case may be, to um, to interpret it accurately. We 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 have to do some other work. Uh, uh, like work in etymology to to figure it out. Um, and there's a little bit of parallels there with agape. Um, that's really my brief introduction to what's going to be a lecture largely about linguistics and uh, particularly agape. And I am going to dig pretty hard into a chapter of my dissertation uh, which I call an excursus on relevant linguistic issues. And then we're going to dig really hard into linguistic fallacies related to the word agape. However, we're going to start like this. I want to know, how have you heard the word agape, the Greek word agape, how have you heard it defined in preaching in particular, and perhaps in books if you've read any, <clears throat> But I, I especially mean in preaching. And Dr. Arnold encouraged me after the first lecture um, not to make constant references to how different the East and the West are because the West has had so much influence in the East that there are a lot of parallels. But I'm curious here as to whether what I've heard is what you've heard. Okay, so agape equals sacrificial love from Kenneth C. <clears throat> Kenneth C., where are you from? Will you tell me? Singapore, okay. What else have you heard? What does agape mean? What does the Greek word agape mean? The highest form of love, God's love, selfless love. He hears it a lot in the Philippines, lots. Okay, Christ-like love, Matthew Rowley, okay? What else have you heard? It, if you're just going to repeat what they said, go ahead and repeat it. I want to know what you've heard. Selfless love of God, just love. John Glass, where are you from? U.S. Okay. All right. Let's hear some more. Unconditional love. Oh, okay. Okay. Let's hear some more. Let's let's get a bunch of responses here. We've got twenty-one participants. I want to hear from more than half. Okay. The most wonderful love in our reach. That's a very interesting way to put it. Okay. Unconditional love. Yeah, that's that's very common. A more intense kind of love. Okay, you're from the Garden State, good. They need that up in New Jersey. <clears throat> Others, I wanna hear from you. Highest form of love that God has for man. Yes, that's something I commonly hear as well. All these answers are exactly what I hear in the US. Yeah, so does Philadelphia, good point. <laughs> Used in free variation with phileo in John 21. Okay. Um, so you've heard, Joseph, you've heard people say that in preaching. You typically hear them say that agapao and phileo uh, are synonyms in John 21. Aha. Yes, Joseph, you hear you, in one BJU dissertation. That's, I think I know whose dissertation that is. Anybody else? Let's hear from you. The highest form of love, sacrificial love, yes. Okay. U.S. and Poland. Yep. <clears throat> oh, so, uh, Dr. Peterson, you hear this in Poland, presumably in Polish. I just want to confirm that. No. Um, let me ask you this, Dr. Peterson. Have you heard uh, Polish preachers um, 
that are not from the U.S., not missionaries, have you heard them mention the word agape explicitly? Is it something that people in the churches would, would know? Like logos uh, and phileo and certain other select Greek and Hebrew words. <clears throat> Okay, he's not heard that. Okay, I'm just curious, interested. Last chance, anybody else? What have you heard agape means? Even if you repeat what someone else says, I'd like to see it. Oh, I see. So John is also a, a missionary in, okay. God's love, the only ones I've ever heard were affiliated with BJU. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Okay. I was curious, and that's helpful. Um, what that says to me, except for that very last comment, is that the meaning of agape, the, this Greek word, is um, commonly, very commonly thought to be a self-sacrificial love. Given, I would say, that when I had to distill this viewpoint, in fact, let me just turn right to my dissertation. Um, okay, theological claims of the standard view of agape love include that agape denotes what might be called capital L Christian love, a supernatural kind of love that only Christians can have, or, or that, of course, God has. Another is that agape is a matter of rational choice, commitment after reasonable evaluation, or I could say rational evaluation, and it's a matter of action. Emotion is incidental, unnecessary, or even counter to agape. Uh, and then the Christian love denoted by agape, this is the common standard view, is given from a superior to an inferior, it's an unconditional love springing entirely from within the nature of the lover to someone who merits no love or someone with whom one is unacquainted. Agape is spontaneous and creative of value. That means it arises out of the lover and that it's not a response to value in, in the object or person loved. And then another point of the standard view is the essential character of agape is self-sacrifice Agape love has no concern for its own benefit. Now, that was my effort in the dissertation to distill what a lot of people were saying. And I must comment that although John Glass has only heard people affiliated uh, with BJU <coughs> say these things, um, I have heard it all over the spectrum. In fact, I have heard, uh, oh, here in Poland, gotcha. Well, I have read liberal, uh, uh, secular Jewish people, um, all kinds of Christians of various sorts say these things. They are absolutely common. And if you got through the reading in, uh, in Carson's book, you will have read a portion. Let me pull it up here. I've got it in front of me. You'll have read a portion that mentions the word agape. In fact, I'm going to bring it up on the screen and share it. And I will share my screen so we can all read it together. Okay, here we go. He is in this section called the root fallacy, and that's the overlap with the hotpox legomena that I promised. Though it's kind of a small overlap concept conceptually, only because hotpox legomena often have to be studied through uh, etymological studies because we don't have any other options. He says, although it's doubtless true that the entire range of agapao and the entire range of phileo are not exactly the same, nevertheless, they enjoy substantial overlap. And where they overlap, <clears throat> appeal to a root meaning in order to discern a difference is fallacious. In 2 Samuel 13, both agapao and the cognate agape, so the verb form and the noun form, of the root word, the main root word for love in scripture. Both can refer to Amnon's incestuous rape of his half-sister Tamar. When we read that Demas uh, for, 
Well, where'd it go? Demas forsook Paul because he loved this present evil world. There's no linguistic reason to be surprised that the verb is agapao. John 3.35 records that the Father loves the Son and uses the verb agapao. John 5.20 repeats the thought, the Father loves the Son, but it uses the word phileo, without any discernible shift in meaning. The false assumptions surrounding this pair of words, agapao and phileo, or noun forms agape and uh, philia, uh, which is much less commonly mentioned, philia is, the false assumptions surrounding this pair of words are ubiquitous, means they're everywhere, and so I shall return to them again, and he does. My only point here is that there is nothing intrinsic to the verb, verb agapao or the noun agape to prove its real meaning or hidden meaning refers to some special kind of love. <clears throat> One more comment here. I've heard many people preached agape means intimate love of God to humanity. Okay, then I'm about to hand you a ticket for pride. <laughs> okay, and let's be real careful about this. I'm going to attack this view, the standard view of agape love. And I'm going to attack it largely linguistically this morning because we're talking about exegetical fallacies, but Lord willing, we'll have some time to talk about some theological problems with it. And let me say from the outset, again, that in handing you this ticket for pride, I don't mean that you should be proud. I think you should be humble. And, and I try to be myself. Any love that I have um, was a gift itself of God through the new covenant. What is the new covenant in Jeremiah 31 except God taking away my heart of stone and giving me a heart of flesh? as the King James puts it, making my heart responsive in love to things that it wasn't responsive to before. So if, if I'm right and all these people are wrong, and I think I am and I think they are, I wouldn't have written this dissertation. Um, nonetheless, I have no reason for pride over their exegetical fallacies, only humility over whatever light God has given me to see. And I encourage you to be the same way. Uh, and I want to say immediately before I attack this view, and it sounds strange, why would I attack uh, what, what sounds so, you know, so positive? Well, you'll see, but I want to say that there really are positives in the view and that self-sacrifice is very clearly something that the, the Bible would call on us to do as a result of our love. Self-sacrifice self is good. Paul says, he will gladly spend and be spent, and he's a model for us. He's set up as a model for us. Um, I'll also say that rational choices are good, and that commitment is good. Um, yeah, that's good, Matthew. Carson had humility, too, to point out his own past errors in the book. Uh, and I don't recall having preached the difference between agapao and phileo, largely because they didn't let me preach very much until I got late into the uh, educational process, but I very possibly could have committed these same errors, and I certainly certainly uh, didn't know that they were errors until um, much time passed and much study did. Um, but we're going to dig into agape, and at least you who hear this lecture and maybe do a little more reading on it, both in Carson and perhaps if you're interested in reading my dissertation, you and my mother-in-law both may enjoy it. <clears throat> Let's start by laying a little foundation by talking about some relevant linguistic issues. Um, my dissertation was about Paul's, uh, Paul's example for us, and he tells us about six times in the New Testament to either he tells us to follow him and, or, or be like him, or he praises people who did. So repeatedly, the Holy Spirit is inspiring Paul to lift himself up as, a, as an example for other Christians to follow. <clears throat> and in fact, he, he makes reference to his own sinfulness uh, being a reason for that, that uh, much as Jesus can have sympathy with our weaknesses, Paul can have sympathy with our sins. Nonetheless, in the New Testament, there's no recorded instance of Paul consciously sinning. I find that very interesting. There's the time when he speaks against the high priest, <clears throat> but when he's told this is the high priest, he immediately backtracks and says, yes, uh, I'm sorry. You know, the, the Bible tells us not to you know, speak evil of the leaders of the people. 
Um, but he did that without knowledge. Um, you know, maybe uh, there are some left-leaning evangelical interpreters who want to see sinfulness and maybe anger elsewhere in Paul, <clears throat> and certainly left-leaning evangelical interpreters who want to see misogyny, that is, hatred of women in Paul. But other than that one passage, unless I'm missing something, I don't detect any sins recorded for us committed by the Apostle Paul, either in Acts or in the Epistles. <clears throat> he is a model for us, a divinely inspired model. That doesn't mean he did not sin. It means that we, we're not aware of those sins after his uh, conversion. And I thought it very interesting, as I looked into the example of Paul in the New Testament, that he, he didn't merely set up his actions as exemplary, but also his emotions, or I could say his religious affections, to borrow a phrase from the Apostle Paul. Um, I'm sorry, from Jonathan Edwards. It is 5.37 a.m. There's my one uh, 5 a.m. mistake. Religious Affections is the title of a great Jonathan Edwards book. Um, he's, he, he asked Timothy to follow his example in his love, for example. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. But in order to get there, we have to talk about these relevant linguistic issues. And Paul's example in the areas of gratitude, joy, and love, and other religious affections, his example has been obscured by... Uh, by linguistic problems, by exegetical fallacies, especially the tradition of what's called theological lexicography. Lexicography is only a word for making dictionaries, writing dictionaries. Uh, what Moises Silva, BJU grad and author of a, an awesome book called Biblical Words and Their Meaning that I've already mentioned to you, it's what Silva calls lexical theology. And um, it's not just the word agape that suffers from this. I mentioned gratitude, hope, and joy as well, and their relevant uh, Greek terms. In my experience, most of the time, I, I already mentioned this in the original languages um, lecture, most of the time preachers mention Greek words in particular, but also Hebrew words. They do something wrong with them. <laughs> It may be wrong just to mention them. I say wrong, not as if it's always a moral issue, just a matter of discretion, prudence, and wisdom. We talked about how mentioning Greek and Hebrew words can lift you up before your congregation in a way that isn't appropriate, make them think that they can't read the Bible for themselves. I'm very leery of that. Um, but also frequently, preachers will mention Greek words in order to run afoul of advice that I quoted to you, I believe, from Rod Decker. Namely, that is, if you cannot make a point from the English text in front of you, or whatever language it is that you're preaching from, Chinese or German or Polish, um, if you can't make the text from the Bible in front of you, then you probably shouldn't make the point at all. If the point that you're making in preaching depends on the meaning of a Greek word or Hebrew word. Um, I, once again, I'm saying probably you shouldn't be making it at all. And if people would just follow that one piece of advice from Rod Decker, who knows a thing or a hundred about linguistics and biblical interpretation and Greek, then the, the most of the trouble about agape, uh, can I say most, a lot of the trouble would be gone. But it's still here because Preachers like to, and, I, and I'm saying this broadly, I'm not accusing any individual, but I'm, I will say this broadly because I've had a lot of experience with it. Preachers like the feeling of impressing people with their knowledge. That's why we started where we did, with humility about others' exegetical fallacies and humility toward our own. Um, many of the re major reference works on pastor's shelves today the Theological Lexi Lexicon of the New Testament, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, the New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology, the, e the uh, Exegetical Dictionary of the New Testament, as well as the less scholarly and more popular level uh, resources like Zodiades, um, Kenneth Wiest, uh, Martin Vincent, W.E. Vine, and Richards. I, I think it's Larry Richards, Lawrence Richards. 
Many of them give false impressions about Paul's religious affections because they adopt this approach of theological lexicography. Um, and let me immediately say, uh, I feel um, awkward uh, criticizing a bunch of people whose work was largely done for the benefit of the church, especially these popular level resources, um, were done by people who are just dedicated to serve the church. And there's plenty profit in these books. I'm not saying they're all completely wrong. Uh, neither am I saying I'm smarter than the people who wrote these major uh, theological dictionaries like the uh, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. I'm not smarter than they are. Um, I am basing my critique off of foundational critiques levied by people like Carson and Silva and especially James Barr. Uh, I am not original here. I'm standing on their shoulders and I'm not even tall enough to reach their own eye level while I stand on their shoulders. Nonetheless, I do understand what they're saying and I think they're very, very right. And that's why I'm teaching you uh, this material. So Craig Blomberg, for example, was very right to say in a review of Richard's popular level work, uh, which is the Zondervan Expository Dictionary of Bible Words, he said, a reference work that inculcates the principle that theology is learned from major teaching passages on a given subject, rather than from word studies or surveys of entries in a concordance, has yet to be written. And I waited till now to define theological lexicography, but that's pretty much it. Um, the principle of theological lexicography is that theology is learned from word studies or surveys of entries in a concordance. Theological lexicography tends to take a word like agape or elpis, which is the Greek word for hope, and tends to pile on a lot of theology. All of the things that you said in your chat messages about what you've heard people say agape means, add them all together. So I'll just do that. The highest form of God, of love that God has for man, a more intense kind of love, unconditional love, the most wonderful love within our reach, selfless love of God, Christ-like love, um, selfless love, uh, sacrificial love, um, love, oh, I didn't see, see, this, see this one before. This is very good. Love that expects no return. Um, let me just make sure I got them all. Yeah, basically all those things. Okay, intimate love of God to humanity. And Lord, don't let me forget to talk about John 21. We will talk about John 21. Um, all of those things get piled onto this one Greek word agape as if that word agape contains all of those ideas. It makes me think of Humpty Dumpty who, uh, who in his conversation with Alice and through the looking glass um, committed a very similar fallacy. And Alice said, that's a great deal to make one word mean. And he says back to her, when I make a word do a lot of work like that, I always pay it extra. We owe a lot to agape and evangelicalism and fundamentalism um, because we make it do a lot of work for us. And in fact, I'm here suggesting that this is theological lexicography and the work that agape has been doing for us is illegitimate. It does not mean all of these things. Even if all of these things are true and taught by the New Testament, they are not taught by the meaning of this individual Greek word, they would be taught, if they're taught at all, by what Blomberg mentions when he says, theology should be learned from major teaching passages on a given subject. <clears throat> In fact, isn't it very odd, has this ever occurred to you, that um, Jesus would say in the great commandments, the most important commands of the Bible are love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And 1 Corinthians 13 would praise love in all these ways. Um, but that G neither Jesus nor Paul would ever uh, define the word love. Isn't it odd, uh, given this view, that we don't have any sentences in the New Testament telling us that a truly Christian love 
is one which is self-sacrificial and does what is best for um, for others regardless of how one feels. That's the key there. We do have verses telling us to be self-sacrificial like Ephesians 5, love uh, husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So yes, self-sacrifice um, is taught in a sentence in the New Testament. But there it is in a sentence. We don't need the word agape to tell us that. We've got a sentence. We don't have any sentences telling us that true Christian love is rational and volitional as opposed to emotional. But that, that note gets hit again and again and again and again. In my experience, that's a huge note. And pastors will use it in their counseling. They will say to a man um, who is in for marital counseling, who says, you know, I just don't love my wife anymore. That spark is gone. They will say what I sometimes find myself saying to my kids, but I try to stop myself, and that is they'll say, it doesn't matter how you feel. You need to do what is right. Is, could that possibly be what Jesus means when he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Could Jesus possibly mean um, love God with self-sacrificial love no matter how you feel, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It doesn't work, and we'll dig into that uh, more as time passes in our, in our uh, two hours this morning. Bible interpreters have not paid sufficient attention to James Barr, even at the higher levels of scholarly work. Treatments of joy and especially love have been affected very deeply by fallacies that he attempted to lay to rest. Um, but... Um, it, 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 leaves, it leaves our understanding of love on a faulty th theoretical foundation. <clears throat> now, I'm going to show you another image in the, um, by sharing my screen. Here is what's called the Ogden, oops, Ogden Richards Triangle. This is a fairly standard way of picturing the relationship of language, the symbols of language, namely words, relating it to the real world and to ourselves. <clears throat> and I will point out that although I've heard that this model has been subject to critique, um, I use it with a huge dose of John Frame and his triperspectivalism. And if you know anything about Frame, and I would strongly encourage you to read John Frame. The Doctrine of the Knowledge of God was epical for me. He talks about the normative, the situational, and the existential perspectives, and I won't get into them. Um, but here, that's what I'm really talking about, the normative, the situational, and the existential perspectives. But this is a convenient way of uh, picturing word meaning, and so let's talk about it. Um, a given word like tree. <clears throat> may have a referent. That is, there's a tree sitting outside my window, actually multiple trees right now. There's the referent right there. When I say there is a tree, that's the one to which I am referring. I am referring the, um, the attention of an individual that I'm speaking to, to this object. There's the referent, tree. However, in Spanish, you don't use the sounds tri to refer to a tree. You use the conventional sounds, arbol. And in Tagalog, it's something else, which you could tell me. And in Polish, it's something I'm sure unpronounceable. When I was in Poland with the musical mission team, and I worked very hard on my pronunciation for the songs, I came up to somebody afterwards, real nice guy, who spoke English, and I said, so was our Polish pretty good? You know, when we were pronouncing it, when the choir was singing it, and he said, no, I just had to give up. Polish is so hard. Well, the, the symbol that we use for this referent, the big tall thing with the trunk and the leaves and the branches, the symbol we use conventionally in English is tree. But there's no necessary connection between this symbol and the referent. And that's why this is a dotted line right here. There could be many different symbols that are used to um, refer um, people that you're speaking to, to a given referent. And so we have to distinguish the referent from the symbol. 
um, <clears throat> even within English, there was a time when the ancestors of English didn't use the word tree. They said something else, quite likely related to it. I'm guessing I haven't looked it up in the Oxford English Dictionary. I could find out. Um, there may be a time in the future when we call it an ergonomoc, for all I know. Language changes. I just read a whole book called Words on the Move by John McWhorter. Fascinating examples of language change after language change. It is ineluctable. Language is always changing, and that's why this is a dotted line. Now, this word tree has lasted a long time because this is a very common referent, but we don't know how long it'll last. <clears throat> Then there's another element to the triangle, and that is the mental response. That's what we call the sense. Sense, symbol, and referent are the three elements of the Ogden Richards triangle. The sense is what occurs inside me when I hear someone else use the word, use the symbol, tree, the sign or signifier, tree, that signifies or points to this referent. The sense is what happens inside me. Um, Language is not an uncomplicated concept. There is so much to say about how words work, <clears throat> how meaning happens. And uh, thank you, Joel. Puno is tree. Wonder if that is Tagalog. And Tagalog has had a lot of Spanish influence, um, but is it an Indo European language? I don't know. Do you know that, Joel? Not really. Okay. Very interesting. Oh, there's, there's our, Spanish, our Polish word, thank you. I won't even try to pronounce it. Um, the Ogden Richards Triangle <clears throat> is something worth keeping in mind as we talk about language because it's a helpful model to distinguish elements of meaning that we need to keep separate but related appropriately. The triangle um, has proven its worth for me and I, and I hope it'll prove its worth as we talk further. So there, there are common words that don't fit the schema, like the word schema uh, does, but the, uh, if I were to say, you know, there simply are no better models for, um, for understanding words. I'm, I'm not sure I could say that, but if I did say that, the word simply doesn't quite fit that model. It, it doesn't have a referent. It's, it's really a it's a grammar kind of word. Um, whereas the word schema evokes a mental response and points to some kind of extra linguistic reality, namely the triangle that I just pictured and explained in this context. But the, a word like simply can evoke a mental response without referring to any object or even any concept like simplicity or simpliness. Simply just has a simply has a sense of a sort, but it has no extra linguistic referent. Some words, on the other hand, can be fully identified with their reference, especially proper names like Mark Lee Ward Jr. or Joel Arnold or John Glass <clears throat> or Plato or even Chevrolet. Virtually every time those words appear, they point to the same reference. So words can get pretty complicated. Uh, I just wanted to make a, a nod to the fact that um, this, this isn't easy, but when it comes to these concepts of love, hope, joy, gratitude, the religious affections of the Apostle Paul that I focused on in my dissertation, and particularly love, I think the triangle is helpful for us because we need to keep distinct sense and reference. This is very important. Sense is something that a word brings to its context. That is, the symbol, the sign, um, agape, or in English, the word love, <clears throat> that, uh, that symbol brings certain senses to the context in which, is, context in which it appears. Um, while reference is something the context brings to the word. And if the two are confused, meaning is apt to travel in the wrong direction. That means eisegesis, reading into the Bible, which is the cardinal sin of biblical hermeneutics. So here's an example from outside the Bible. The word think has two senses, and that particular word that we call it a lexeme, because it's 
found in the, in the dictionary, it always brings one of these senses into the context in which it appears. It either brings the idea of having a particular opinion, belief, or idea about something, someone or something. So something like, I think your outfit matches. Or the word think brings the idea of directing one's mind towards someone or something, like I'm thinking about whether or not your outfit matches. But in the context of a philosophical treatise, thinking as an abstract word can both evoke a sense and point to a contextually defined concept. You're talking about thinking. For example, a philosopher is free to write a book in which he argues for a particular concept of what thought is that is different from other philosophers' constructs. When he uses thinking in the context of his own work, readers will naturally infer that he's pointing to what he has previously said that thinking is. And that's where um, uh, context or reference is something that the context brings to the word. You can, you can use a word sort of as a technical term or even a quasi-technical term within your own writing um, because you're referring to the concept as you have defined it and discussed it. This is all important for how we understand agape because theological lexicography often reverses the flow of meaning. It's frequently guilty of the illegitimate totality transfer that James Barr described and that I pictured for you when I took all the meanings that you gave of the word agape in our chat and piled them on the word agape. Because theological lexicography lexicography tends to sketch out a broad concept of love or hope or joy or gratitude or holiness or what have you based on a number of biblical passages and then read all of that meaning back into individual instances of those words. And I'm skipping to a, um, kind of a point of practical application here again, but it's so very important. Why shouldn't you do that? Well, among the reasons for that is when you do that, you tend to import ideas that, didn't, that you didn't get from the New Testament at all, and people can't question you in your congregation if you're preaching to them. Who in your congregation has the capacity to say, um, that's not what that lexeme refers to, uh, or that's not what it refers to in this context? No, if you, if you, the pastor, say this word in Greek is agape, and it means self-sacrificial self love given without reference to someone's desert um, and given um, independent of value and with no emotion necessarily involved. They, they don't know any better. They're not going to question you. They've heard this from tons of other preachers too. Um, but even if there's no sentence in their Bible telling them these things, they will trust you. Theological lexicography uh, is, is also a pastoral problem. And it gives these words like agape, el peace, kara, which means joy, eucharistia, which means gratitude. It gives them meaning, more meaning than the New Testament authors intended them to have. Now, in some cases, that meaning is neither misleading nor particularly helpful. So here's a hopox legomenon, the word pale, which means conflict or warfare. And one work of theological lexicography, the TDNT, um, defines it that way and leaves it at that. <clears throat> um, and that's fine. There's no difference basically between that and a standard lexicon. But think of a word like uh, tokos, which means poor. This word, poor, in the TDNT gets a 25,000 word essay. That alone ought to cause you to be a little suspicious. Could a Greek word really possibly mean as much as is required for a 25,000 word essay? And when an essay like this occurs, it easily clouds New Testament usages of the word with a lot of verbiage and a lot of theology imported in. Um, it can actually hinder those who are trying to understand verses in the New Testament, like the poor have the good news preached to them. The concept of poverty has to be kept distinct from the meaning of the word tokas, where misunderstandings can result. Now, I have kind of sprayed a fire hose at you, and I could do more in linguistics. And if this interests you at all, I, again, would love to have you pick up my dissertation, and uh, I can tell you how to get a hold of that. Um, but I basically wanted to whet your appetite 
for the value of studying linguistics and studying particular lexicography and semantics in the field called pragmatics, which is how we know or how words are used, uh, how meaning uh, is produced online, that is in context. Um, but I am going to um, get to, I would say, easier to understand material because it's going to be more concrete. When we come back after a break, we're going to talk about um, how to apply some of our linguistic study that we just, just barely scratched the surface of uh, over to this word uh, agape. And I'll see you in five minutes unless Joel has any comments to make. No, that's great. We'll see you in five minutes. Thank you. discouraged by the fact that everyone so readily said they'd heard the standard view of agape. It means it's everywhere, like I thought, um, but it also means you need my dissertation. So um, I want to make, let's jump right in. I want to make two more comments, uh, two more quotations about linguistics in general before we dig into the linguistic fallacies of the standard view of agape love. Um, this is a very, very important quotation I'm about to share with you, and I'm going to share my screen again. This is James Barr. I'll make sure everyone can see this. <clears throat> he says, Theological thought of the type found in the New Testament has its characteristic linguistic expression not in the word individually, but in the word combination or sentence. Okay, let's, let's just think about that real quick. How do we get meaning? When, um, when you think of the various um, virtues that the Bible would have you inculcate, like honesty, like love, like hope and joy and gratitude, like purity, um, why didn't God simply list out all the virtues that we're supposed to have. Um, there certainly are virtue lists and vice lists in the New Testament, things we're supposed to do, things we're not supposed to do. But they are set in contexts and given explanations. Um, there are stories that fill them out, like the story of the Good Samaritan fills out neighbor love. Um, the reason that the New Testament and the Bible in general doesn't just list out the virtues we're supposed to have and the vices we're not supposed to have is that we need more than that for meaning. We need sentences in order to explain. <clears throat> and the attempt, Barr says, to relate the individual word directly to the theological thought leads to the distortion of the semantic contribution made by words and contexts. The value of the context comes to be seen as something contributed by the word, and then it is read into the word as its contribution, where the context is in fact different. Thus, the word becomes overloaded with interpretative suggestion. This is exactly what happens with agape, as we'll come to see. Um, and I won't dig further into this statement because it's going to make more sense as we actually dig into the word agape. But I want to give one more from Colin Hemer. Uh, Tyndall House is uh, where he was a researcher. He's passed away now. Tyndall House is an evangelical study house at Cambridge. Look for what they produce. Um, very high level uh, evangelical uh, work coming out of that study center. And Colin Hemer, in a Tyndall Bulletin article some years back, wrote that Christians took current vocabulary, so he's talking about the New Testament here, um, they took current vocabulary of Koine Greek in senses essentially current, and those words became enriched in their associations by the new contexts in which they were used. It's exceedingly difficult to say where the semantic content of the word first took on a specially Christian flavor apart from context. I am not sure that the first Christians can be shown to have done much more than use some of the semantic resources, and he's talking here of the pistis or faith word group, with an unusual frequency and characteristic focus dictated by the subject matter of their gospel. Let's unpack that a little bit, and then we'll dig into agape, as I promised. Um, when you in your own preaching, talk about love. How often 
in your talk about love, do you mention love for ice cream? How often do you mention love for high fashion? How often do you mention love for anything um, sort of outside the Christian realm? Um, I would think that you probably do mention it sometimes, but because preaching is largely about the Bible and about matters relevant to the Christian faith very directly, of course, every matter is relevant to the Christian faith, um, but because you're talking holy talk, you're talking directly from Scripture, hopefully, you are most likely to use the word love most frequently to mention love of God and neighbor or love from God. Um, does that mean that within that that you have changed the English word love to mean something specifically Christian? <clears throat> and Colin Hemer's answer is no. You know, um, you can use a word like love, and um, it's not necessarily taking on a Christian flavor. You're just you're just talking about um, uh, with an with a Okay, the focus dictated by the subject matter of your preaching means that there's an unusual frequency of the word love to speak about Christian reference. Okay, I'll stop sharing my screen. I got some comments here. Um, church, yes. In fact, that's an example I was going to give, John Glass. Um, that is, that's one of the words, ecclesia, congregation, church, that is most, that, that, that's the first word that comes to my mind when I think of a technical term in the New Testament, something that non-Christians would have read and realized, you know, the New Testament is talking about this in a very particular way, dictated by the subject matter of the New Testament, uh, rather than using the word commonly, uh, using the word the way it's commonly used, you know, outside the New Testament. Uh, another comment here, do you believe that there have been some meanings that were invented by the preacher's own idea, which seems to be associated with scripture, but not really? Yes, and I think agape is a great example of that. And after an hour and 15 minutes of promising that we'd really get into it, now I finally will. This is chapter 10 of my dissertation. Um, the culminating chapter, the standard view of agape love. And oops, here we go. Let me open with some of the quotations that... Uh, one quotation that I read in, I believe, a secular, I think a secular Jewish psychologist, I, I could be wrong, or maybe he was mainline Protestant, I, you know, I, now I'm just forgetting. He wasn't an evangelical Christian, and this is what he said. Love is not a feeling. Love is an action, an activity. True love is an act of will that often transcends ephemeral feelings of love. Love is as love does. That was M. Scott Peck. And there, there um, a non-Christian person is saying the very same thing that Christians do. doesn't mean that he's wrong or that we're wrong. Uh, but in this case, I think he is. And I think that Christians who say the same thing are wrong, especially when they add that these ideas, love is not a feeling, love is an action, when they say that this stems directly from the meaning of this word agape. Paul's views on and his practice of love are an important part of the example that he set for all believers. So I, I mentioned earlier that, he, earlier that he praised Timothy because he said, you have followed my love, 2 Timothy 3.10. And he tells Timothy, set the believers an example in love, in spirit and faith and purity. But love is one of the things that Timothy is supposed to be an example in. Um, love is the chief of the affections. It's the great commandment. It's the greatest of the faith, hope, love triad in 1 Corinthians 13. And all of the references to love in these uh, verses, Matthew 22 and Mark 10, I'm sorry, Mark 12, I believe, uh, where the great commandment is listed, as well as 1 Corinthians 13, use this same root, agape. And I'm going to use the word agape, the noun form, throughout this discussion, though sometimes I'll be referring to the verb form. I'm talking about the root, agape. <clears throat> Um, I found, remarkably, both scholars and lay people, liberals and conservatives, secularists and Christians, uh, commonly agreed that agape carries the weight of this entire Christian ethic, the way Christians should treat others. Um, but one of the reasons I 
I attack this view, the standard view of agape love, is that it questions whether love really belongs in a list of Paul's religious affections, because it views love quite specifically as an action and not, at least not necessarily, a feeling. So Joseph Fletcher's infamous book, Situation Ethics, from back in the 60s, I think it was, says, for example, there can be no command, no obligation, no duty to love if love is affection. Genuine emotion cannot be turned on and off like water from a faucet simply by an act of will or willing obedience to a command. But the works of will, of love, they can, he says. He believes that volitional, actional love is the very lexical meaning of agape. I mentioned for you theological claims of the standard view of agape love. Now I want to list in the time we have remaining and evaluate some of the linguistic claims, exegetical fallacies associated with it, and Lord willing, build up to a, a, a brief theological critique that I keep promising. The standard view of agape love, um, of agape, the Greek word in particular, can be summarized um, into linguistic and theological claims, and here are three linguistic claims of the standard view of agape love. And I'm going to share my screen again because this verbiage gets pretty intense and uh, maybe easier to follow if you're reading along. Linguistic claims of the standard view of agape love. One, agape was a Greek word seldom used before the New Testament era. It was chosen by the New Testament writers because of its comparative colorlessness and small number of other associations so that it could be invested with a special Christian meaning. In this, they were following the similar preliminary work of the Septuagint, the Septuagint being the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Two, this is the second linguistic claim of the standard view of agape love. Agape love is to be distinguished from other Greek words for love. Phileo is emotional, natural, and instinctive, while agape and contradistinction, is volitional and supernatural. Eros is sexual and acquisitive in contrast to agape, which is spiritual and giving. Storge, and I'll never forget C.S. Lewis in his, one of his few recorded books, says, pronounces it storge. Storge is natural and familial, whereas agape is supernatural and far more than biological. And the third view, third uh, element of this view, agapao is commanded, okay, that agapao is commanded while phileo is not, shows that the former, agapao, is more volitional. The prevalence of verbs in 1 Corinthians 13 also shows that love is an action. Have you heard people use these supporting arguments? What would you say? Not just have you heard the view, but you have you heard these supporting arguments, like uh, agapao is is commanded while phileo is not. Yeah, okay. Others have heard these. I have definitely heard these, and in a sense, this is an example of more advanced exegesis. It's the more educated preachers, in my experience, who tend to give these supporting arguments, like 1 Corinthians 13 shows that love is a verb, love is an action. Um, less educated preachers will give the same basic view, but not necessarily give these linguistic arguments. So, in the eyes of this standard view of agape, phileo love is an affection, but there isn't much theological value in that word group. The standard view puts such a heavy accent on volition when defining the agape word group that affection, one's internal bent, and emotion, the more vigorous and sensible fruit of that bent, they don't seem to have a necessary place in Christian love. Um, so, let's evaluate this. Um, I'm going to have to leave a lot of technical discussion for anybody who's inter interested enough to read the, the dissertation, but I want to pick out some high points. The very first point of the standard view of agape love, um, that it is, let me pull up the exact words again, that it is, was a Greek word seldom used before the New Testament era, chosen by the New Testament writers because of its comparative colorlessness, and that they were following the work of the, uh, the Septuagint writers, uh, translators. Um, this this very first point, 
has significant weaknesses. Um, the Septuagint is not quite the theological on-ramp that this view supposes. The noun form of agape in the Septuagint shows up just 19 times in 18 verses in a very large book, namely the Old Testament. The, the 70, the translators of the Septuagint, they used agape once to speak of the love of a bride, Jeremiah 2.2. And let's, would you pull that up if you would? Um, we're going to look at a couple passages, and I'm just going to ask that you follow along in those passages. The word of the Lord came to me saying, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, youth, your love as a bride how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. That is translated from the Hebrew word ahav, I believe. Let me check to make sure. Yes, or the noun form of uh, ahav. And it's translated with the Greek word agape. Um, Ecclesiastes 9, 1 and 6. All this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise in their deeds are in the hand of God, whether it is love or hate, Man does not know, both are before him. In verse 6, their love and their hate and their envy have already perished. In either of these contexts, does agape seem to carry any special um, Christian or even Jewish, in this case, meaning? Thank you for putting those verses in there. I should have thought of that, um, Joel. Or are these passages using the word love just the way we do? to refer to all kinds of lovers and loved objects. There will be the occasional parent who tells his five-year-old child, don't say you love ice cream, say you like it. Or there'll be the eight-year-old clever child who says to the other eight-year-old, um, oh, you love ice cream? Does that mean you're gonna marry it? Um, but the mere fact that, that these are standard common sayings a common eight-year-old joke and a relatively common thing for parents to say is, uh, is a suggestion that this is a, an established meaning of the word love. We use the word love to indicate our internal attitude towards all kinds of objects. I can love riding the roller coaster. In fact, I don't. Maybe you do. I can love climbing trees. I can love shooting my air rifle. I can love my wife. I can love God. And in English, this word love is used for all of these, and nobody gets confused. Nobody thinks that my internal attitude toward my wife is precisely the same as my internal attitude toward vanilla ice cream from Dairy Queen. I'm able to use this word love as, uh, with, uh, to refer to both instances of love without people being confused. And so far in the Septuagint, what I'm suggesting is that we're seeing the very same thing. The, the love of a bride is used as a comparison to the love of the Israelites for God in that Jeremiah passage. Um, and there's no equivocation there. That is, it's not as if the love of a bride is one thing and the love for God is another. They're both an internal attitude of liking very much. And then Ecclesiastes 9, in that passage, um, love and hate are spoken of as uh, uh, also in what I could almost call a secular way. There's no specific Christian or religious reference to these things. Um, the, the, these are just the general loves and hates that people have um, and that we all have. We all love certain things, many things, and we all hate certain things. At the beginning of Religious Affections, Jonathan Edwards points out that basically if we didn't love, then nobody would do anything. Love is the fountain of all that we do. Um, and I think that view is not just consistent with, but actually taught in Scripture and these very first two references that we've looked at are at least consistent with what I'm saying. Uh, the most shocking instance of agape in the Septuagint occurs in 2 Samuel 13, 15. And I'm going to beat you to it there, Joel, and put it in the, uh, oops, that's not good. Oh, 2 Samuel 13, 15, there we go. Okay, 
Then Amnon hated her, that's Tamar, with very great hatred. This is after he raped her. So that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And he said to her, get up and go. Guess what Greek words the Septuagint translators used to translate the words love and loved. They used agape, the noun form, and agapao, the verb form. Um, when you give examples in your preaching, or let's say when you've heard other preachers give examples of this of agape love, has any has any of them ever mentioned Second Samuel thirteen fifteen? Somehow I doubt it. Somehow I doubt it. And yet the Septuagint translators who let, let's let's acknowledge something they knew Koine Greek better than any one of us ever possibly could. They were native speakers of it, okay? They felt that agape was the appropriate word. Now, we're talking about an era previous to the New Testament by, we're not totally sure how far. Um, so it is possible that the word agape adjusted its meaning over time. But that's, pr that's a pretty big adjustment right there from a word that can mean exactly what we would mean when we would say this in English, um, if you talk about a rapist who loved his victim, but then once he had his way with her, he hated her as much as he had loved her, you could say that in English. And they're using the word agape the very same way we were, would in English. Um, to get there, from there, to a place where agape has this very specific and very full Christian meaning, that's, that's quite a journey, quite a journey for one word. Agape occurs 11 times in the Song of Songs, where it's always used of romantic or erotic love. And though the Wisdom of Solomon, which is also in the Septuagint, of course, but not in uh, the canonical scriptures, it uses agape three times in more religious contexts, the Septuagint very clearly never used the Greek word agape to mean capital A, agape, the way that Christian preachers very frequently define it and that you put in your chat messages a while back. Um, there is a complicated argument that Silva picks up from Robert Jolie and that I think Carson has, you know, I think it may not be in, in exegetical fallacies, but in his book, The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God, where basically um, he shows that, uh, and I actually translated this book from French very laboriously to get at this, and it was worth it. Uh, he basically shows that agapao had to fill in for some uh, semantic change in the word phileo, because it had to fill in for some semantic change in the word kuneo uh, for some complicated lexical reasons. Um, and so there was some change going on in the word, and it basically what Robert Jolie demonstrates is that long before the New Testament, Agapao replaced phileo as the standard word for love, just like in English. And I think uh, the best parallel to um, agape and agapao is the English word love, uh, because we can use it for so many things. When you look up love in the dictionary, um, you'll get an intense feeling of deep affection, um, but you'll also get um, a great interest in and pleasure in something, like his love for football, or we share a love of music. And in English is flexible enough. The word love in English is flexible enough to handle both of those things. Well, it's exactly the same way in agape. And you wouldn't, it, it would just be silly to go around policing other people's language the way the way I mentioned earlier, where a, where a parent might say, don't say you love ice cream, say you like it because love should be reserved for your husband or wife or for God or whatever. No, we just talk. We, you know, going around policing other people's language um, isn't a way of showing that you care a lot about language. It's a way of showing that you're arrogant. When, when, uh, when educated people talk unselfconsciously, what they say is English. That's what English is. How do you define English except especially standard American English or standard Singaporean English or any kind of English, Kenyan English, you define it by the way educated people actually talk. Going around complaining about what people all do naturally in, in language 
is a fool's errand. It will not work. No one will ever change. And you will do it the next day. The next day you will say, I love ice cream. I guarantee it. You can't even police your own language that well. We need this word for all kinds of sen senses or, or uh, situations. And Greek was the same way. Um, let's talk then about agape and the other Greek words for love. So um, even C.S. Lewis, who is one of my all-time favorite writers and is about conservative estimates put him at about three million times smarter than me. Nonetheless, his book, The Four Loves, which is still an awesome book, which you should definitely read, and I love, 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 love C.S. Lewis. It's just brilliant. Oh, he's such a delight. Um, that book still commits a basic error, or at least facilitates one. Now, Lewis knew Greek better than I did, too, and he knew philology better than I do. So I don't know how this happened. But the fact is that when, when Lewis um, sets up uh, agape, philia, eros, and storge as love archetypes, he very easily invites the fallacy that these words always mean these archetypes. And somehow I think Lewis was too smart for that. I, I think um, he didn't really think that. Um, I won't get into that. I just wanted to both mention and defend Lewis a little bit here before it, it might sound to someone who's read The Four Loves that I'm critiquing him. Uh, but I love him too much uh, to think that he could be this wrong. Um, these words, these four Greek words for love, are among the relatively few Greek words that many more educated American churchgoers will know, along with logos uh, other, and other Hebrew words like hallelujah um, uh, or bara for create or Yahweh, uh, or Adonai. Um, these are words that kind of make it into the educated Christian's lexicon, uh, even if they don't know Greek or Hebrew. <clears throat> um, but as early as 1918, B.B. Warfield noted in an essay on the major love terminology that eros and erao uh, are used in some obviously non-erotic contexts in Koine Greek, including an, an exhortation to children to love their mothers. So the, the absolute distinction between phileo meaning a familial love, agapao meaning a rational, volitional, divine love and unconditional love, eros meaning a sexual love and storge meaning a familial love. Um, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't work when you go to the, the actual usage data. And, and the usage data that really matters for us, and here's where we're gonna get to John 21, uh, is the New Testament. The New Testament itself uses phileo and agapao in ways that are frequently, apparently interchangeable. So let's look up, let's get some uh, more verses here in the chat. And Joel, I would ask if you wouldn't mind, could you copy Luke eleven forty two to 43 into the chat window? <clears throat> Uh, and okay, Kenneth C., can we say the scripture defines agapao with its own lingo? Good question. How, how would we know that? The answer is we would have to look at the actual uses of the word. So let's do it. Here are some uses. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you neglect. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some ellipses in here. You'll just have to follow along. You neglect justice and the love of God, and that's agape. Woe to you, Pharisees, next verse, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Okay, so is scripture defining agapao with its own lingo in this case? Here's love, uh, uh, here, here's the same root used in a space of two verses, and Jesus is setting up a contradistinction here. He's setting up a distinction between love of God and love of the best seat in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplaces. Um, what the standard view of agape love would tend to say is, well, the love of God is a specific kind of love. And the love of the seats in the synagogues, well, that's different. <laughs> but I say, well, he uses the same word in the space of two sentences. If, if this... Um, if this root can mean such radically different things, in the first, in, in the first verse, Luke 4, 11, 42, if it, if it can mean this uh, self-sacrificial, volitional, non-emotional, 
unconditional love for God. And then right in the next verse, it means an acquisitive, selfish love for prominence. That doesn't work very well. We know what words mean by observing how they're used. And we act, a principle of linguistics and a principle of interpretation is that you actually look for the least contribution a word can make in a given sentence, the least, not the most, for that sentence to make sense. And in this case, we want to look for, in essence, the lowest common denominator. What is the lowest common denominator between these two uses of the word love? Well, it's exactly what the dictionary, the, the, stand, the uh, contemporary English dictionaries say love means today, an intense feeling of deep affection or a great interest and pleasure in something. I have a great interest and pleasure in God. I have an intense feeling of deep affection for God. The Pharisees had an intense feeling of deep affection for the prominence they got when they had the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. They had a deep interest and pleasure in those things. We, um, it's much easier to say that that's all agape is, um, is communicating the context. Now, let's see. Um, got some comments here. I think it's just equating those two things being loved. Okay. I'm not totally sure I follow uh, what you're... I don't know if you're disagreeing or agreeing, and if you want to clarify, please do, Kenneth C. Um, and Joseph Ng, is there room for defining by authorial or chronological usage Pauline versus Johannine or pre-post-Jerusalem council? Um, there's room for that, but I would say extremely little. Why? Because in linguistics, we talk about synchronic usage and diachronic usage. The synchronic usage of a term is how a word is used in a given time, basically within one time window. And you could say within a generation, um, sometimes less. Um, whereas diachronic usage is tracing the way a word is used throughout time. In Carson's book, he sh you read, if you read the se selection about the root fallacy, which is also called the etymological fallacy or the genetic fallacy, and he points out that the word, I think he used the example of the word nice, which used to mean fool, foolish. And now it doesn't mean that. It's, it's a nice word. It's a positive word. Um, there's not some sort of basic meaning of the word nice that is stuck around. It has radically changed in its meaning over time. Um, but it's taken a long time for that to happen. And the, um, the, the space in which the space of time in which the New Testament was written is not a very long space of time. It's effectively one generation plus maybe a little with John. But the fact is that all the writers of the New Testament lived during the time of Jesus and were born before uh, Jesus' ministry. So it's if basically one lifetime. Uh, the likelihood that this word would change that much uh, that it would go from a place where Jesus could say, you agapao, the best seats in the synagogues, to a place where that word could mean something extremely specific and Christian, freighted with a lot of theological meaning. That's, that is unlikely. Kennedy, thank you for your comment. Okay, let's move on. 1 John 2.15. Joel, do you mind putting that in the, uh, in the chat? You know this verse, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Once again, We've got agapao and agape in the same verse denominating both sinful and Christian objects of love. Rather than saying that there is a Christian kind of love, as if it's a different feeling inside you than the non-Christian or secular kind of love that you have for ice cream, let's say. Uh, or even football, or, or a good novel. Um, rather than saying that the love itself differs, I would rather do what the New Testament does and never define love. It never defines it. 1 Corinthians 13 does not give a definition of love. I would rather never define it, but instead assume that if you're made in the image of a God who is love, you can't not know what someone means when he says, don't love something. Now, it's, we may have difficulty knowing what the world means, and I think we do. That's, that's a difficult and complicated concept. And there you go. There's a technical term in the New Testament. Uh, cosmos. That's what I wanted to write my dissertation on before it got stolen by somebody else. 
uh, at my school. <clears throat> Long story. Do not love the world or things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The lowest common denominator interpretation there um, would be instead of seeing the word love as denominating a kind of love, a particular feeling, instead, let's differentiate love by its objects. There's love of God. There's love of neighbor. And love of God has got to be at the top of your list because he's the most valuable. He's the most valuable entity in the universe. Because people are made in the image of God, they're second. You love them too. And you love them uh, in second place. Where do you put um, other things like the Bible? Well, boy, I don't know. You know, you put that up right up there near God, with God, because it's his words. Where do you put the people in your church? Where do you put your particular church? Where do you put your favorite books? Um, <clears throat> where do you put um, any other of the many good things that you love? You, you put them in the ordo amoris, as Augustine said. You put them in the right value, value order. And um, what the, the, the problem with sinful loves in the New Testament is not necessarily that you're loving something that's bad. It's that you are loving something that you shouldn't love as much as you do. Let me, uh, let me see if I can uh, provide an example. And at 643, I don't think I'm going to. We're going to have to move on with some of these uh, other examples. Okay, let me just check the chat going on. Good, we got some good chats going on. Would you, why do you say that 1 Corinthians 13 does not define love? Okay, I am going to take that rabbit trail. Let's go on, because it's not. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13. What is a definition? Let me see here. First Corinthians 13. Um, let's look for a definition. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm a noisy gong or clanging symbol. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Interestingly, pause there. If love is self-sacrifice, if that's what it is, if that's what agape is, then this makes no sense. If I give away all I have and deliver up my body to be burned, but don't have love, I gain nothing. That's like saying, I have a bicycle, but it has two wheels. Uh, what? It doesn't make any sense. Okay. Here's where people think they get a definition. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. What I'm going to suggest here, going to argue more than suggest, is that this is not a definition. This is a description. Um, and a description is the best we can do for something as, as deep as love. What is a definition except a marking off of a concept? This is what this communicates. But, is, but could we say that love communicates every time we use the word, okay? And in order for love to mean this, in order for this to be the 1 Corinthians 13 to provide a definition of love, it would have to mean... Every time you use it, patience and kindness, not envying or boasting, not arrogance or rudeness, not insisting on its own way, not irritable or resentful, not rejoicing at wrongdoing, rejoicing with the truth, bearing all things, believing all things, hoping all things, enduring all things, and not ending. Is that a definition? No, 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 no. That's way too much for a definition. Okay, now here's where we get into sense and referent into, and into Colin Hemer's comment. Colin Hemer says that um, he's not sure that words like pistis, or in this case agape, were, um, uh, were used with anything more than sort of a, a, a common, uh, uh, what, what did he say? You know, I've got to look at it here. Colin Hemer said, um, with an unusual frequency, okay, I'm not sure that the first Christians can be shown to have done much more than use some of the semantic resources of this word group with an unusual frequency and characteristic focus dictated by the subject matter of their gospel. And this gets a little complicated. 
um, because I think what we have here is Paul doing that, okay? He is using the word agape with an unusual frequency and characteristic focus dictated by the subject matter. I also think that because he has done that, when he talks about love as an abstracted concept, okay? So when it's not a verb, when it's a noun, and when he's talking about love, okay, which is typically what happens when you use it in the noun form, this gets complicated. When he's doing that, Paul is, is making reference to a concept that he and the rest of the Bible have built up. What is that concept full of? Its concept, it, the concept is full of all of the objects that you're supposed to love according to the Bible, especially God and neighbor. And it's full of a, a ranking of those loves. God at the top, neighbors next, other things lower. Um, that, is as, that is the unique contribution of the Bible um, to, to a particularly Christian, you know, Yahwistic concept of love. And when Paul, so when Paul mentions love in general, love as a concept, he knows, you know, we ought to know, and he knows that we ought to know, he's not referring to, um, to all the things the Bible says we're not supposed to love. But ne again, neither is he defining the word. Um, William Sutton, how does this reflect upon the comment, why am I getting a call in the minute? morning at 6.48 a.m. How does this reflect upon the command to emote? The counselor who tells the husband to love his wife whether he feels like it or not. Can emotion be commanded? And I am still getting a phone call. I will try to turn off that uh, notification. It's not going away. So sorry about this. Okay, it's gone. Um, how does this reflect upon the command, command to emote? With 11 minutes left, let me just promise that I will try to, to get there. Oh, and you're tempting me, Kenneth. See, faith is not defined by Hebrews 11.1. One. Um, that's closer to a definition. Faith is the substance, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But still, I, I don't see a classic definition there, the way that we use that word definition within uh, uh, contemporary English. Um, I see a theological description. 1 Corinthians 13, Joel says, the meaning is brought by the context, not in some separate way from a technical meaning rooted in the word itself. Right. Um, and, okay, John Glass will finish his comment in a minute. Let me do a little bit more before I get to William Sutton's uh, excellent question slash comment. I was in, okay, here we go. Okay. Okay, so we were looking at passages and let me just rattle off a couple more here. Um, can agape and this word root, can it mean? Uh, and yes, I keep getting distracted by this. This is really great. I like the discussion. Matthew Riley, you're right. We don't have the right to define a word. Usage defines. That's exactly it. We have to observe the way the word is used. What access do we have to the meaning of a word except observing the way that, that is used? That's the only access we have. So John 3.19, people loved the darkness rather than the light. John 12.43, they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. All these are the agape word group. Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. Balaam, loved gain from wrongdoing. Revelation 12, they loved not their lives even unto death. And in this case, loving their lives would have been a sin. So here are uh, multiple uses of the word love in the New Testament. And there aren't really all that many. The New Testament's not a huge book. Um, and these are referring to sinful loves. Can it be that agape, the word group, means this very specific Christian love when the New Testament uses the word in such a way, like the, the Septuagint, to mean other kinds of love that are, in these cases, sinful, or even just kind of secular, like Jesus says um, in Matthew 5, um, what, pro, you know, what benefit to, is it to you if you love your friends? Don't even the publicans love their friends? That's not Christian, but it's not sinful either. It's, it's in a way, I could, could just call it secular. The, 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 
the usage of the word agape and agapat in the New Testament doesn't bear out these very specific meanings. Let me give uh, one more example, then I will skip to the theology. L that is, let us handle one more of the uh, linguistic arguments. Okay, the third linguistic point, and I'm, this is going to be quick. The third linguistic point of the standard view that agapao is more volitional, that means has more to do with your will than your emotions, that it's more volitional than phileo because agapao is commanded and phileo is not. How many of you have heard that particular argument before? I'm curious. Let me know. <clears throat> this, um, okay, a couple people have heard it. I'm going to keep going for time's sake, but you keep letting me know. This runs afoul of James Barr's warning uh, that uh, uh, the belief in the necessary reflection of theological, theological structures in linguistic structures causes the distortion of linguistic evidence. You know, it's possible that Christian love is more volitional than other concepts of love. Um, but linguistic structures are not likely to be reliable supporting evidence for this position. And yet, this is the primary exegetical argument for seeing agape as volitional and therefore not primarily as emotion or, uh, or affection. But meaning is just not tied directly to morphology and uh, linguistic form, as this point supposes. So, um, what, think of it this way. When the God of the universe speaks through scripture, whatever he says, no matter what grammatical mood he uses, whether he's using imperative or not, is something that you've got to believe or love or do or fear or flee or whatever. So in Psalm 1, when Psalm 1 says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, this never says don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. There's no imperative mood there, but there's an imperative implied. Don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. There's a norm in there. Same with Mark 10, 21. Jesus loved the rich young ruler. There's an imperative in there. Even though it's not in the imperative mood, people ought to love others too. Every line of scripture constitutes some sort of norm, even if it's just believe that X, Y, or Z happened. An examination of the full context of each use of agapao is necessary to determine whether or not the spirit's stress is on volition as opposed to emotion. And I don't think I see that personally anywhere in the New Testament. Um, and the, the, the verb phileo only occurs 25 25 times in the New Testament anyway, and agapao, the verb form, only occurs 143. And agapao verb imperatives only occur 10 times in the New Testament. So to draw a firm theological conclusion from such, such a small sample size is very tenuous. Okay. Mm, oh, I'm going to squeeze in one more linguistic point and then get onto, um, onto some of the theological stuff. In 1 Corinthians 13, one writer wrote that Paul argues that love, oh, John 21, 2. Oh my goodness, I promised that, didn't I? Okay, we'll try, six minutes. Paul argues, this writer says, that love is an action, not an emotion. Sometimes when you hear these statements about agape, just, just do a gut check, just look at the text. 1 Corinthians 13, does it, does, it, does it bear that out? Love is an action, not an emotion? Count the emotions in here. Love is patient and kind. I, I think I hear some emotion in there. Love doesn't envy or boast. I think I feel some emotion in there. Is boasting, is the sin of boasting mainly what you say or the feeling behind it? And envy is a feeling. It's not arrogant or rude. There's feeling in there too. And if you don't believe that, listen to verse six. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Are you going to tell me that rejoicing is an action and not an emotion? That is silly. Not at all possible with that word. Okay, John 21. Very briefly, oh boy, this is so hard to do briefly. If there's any place in the New Testament where agapao and phileo are set in contradistinction to one another, and therefore um, we need to find some difference in the meaning between the two words rather than seeing them as basically synonymous. This may be the passage. However, this is what I would say. And you're just going to have to buy the dissertation. and It'll be cheap um, if you want to read more. Um, I hope to get this in a journal article form, but it just hasn't come to be. Um, my, my, here's what I would say. I don't think we know what the difference between the two words is, if there's a difference. Um, and uh, I have one very astute friend who says he thinks the difference is the opposite. And I've, I've read this in a book too, that, um, that rather than uh, Jesus saying, um, 
do you even, okay, do you, do you love me? Do you love me um, with this special kind of love? Do you even phileo me? Do you even love me with familial love? Rather than that, um, there's an alternative view which basically sees it as Jesus is saying, um, uh, a low level love. Do you love me? Do you love me with aga- with, a, with agape, which isn't a very demanding kind of love? And phile- and and then at the end he says uh, he ups the ante. Do you do you really love me with you know phileo love? And I don't think we can discern that because we're not native speakers. Something else I'd say that Carson points out, Jesus also varies the words for flock and sheep. Is he, is he making a distinction there? You know, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, shepherd my sheep. I can't remember the precise wording there. Um, is, is, he, is he drawing uh, attention to some kind of distinction in those words? Or is he just using them um, for stylistic variation? Uh, I don't think we can know the answer to that question. And the people who speak very confidently about it generally assume a lot of other, uh, I think, very doubtful things about the possible meaning of agapao and phileo. William Sutton said, how does this reflect upon the command to emote, the counselor who tells the husband to love his wife whether he feels like it or not? Okay, this is what I'd say. Uh, Is emotion commanded, sorry, was emotion created by God? Let's be real careful with this. Was emotion created by God? The answer is yes and no. Yes, he created it, but he has it. God loves. God hates. God is love. Um, God is angry. There are people who want to view those in this really deep philosophical way that somehow denies that God actually has feelings. I get really impatient with that, frankly. Um, I I understand what they're trying to protect, the value of an immutable God, but God speaks of himself as relating to us as person to person. And when he calls himself by personal names like Father and Jesus as Son, he, he is imputing to him things that we're supposed to gather from our understanding of our experience. Um, and what, how, how can we know what God is love? What, how can we know what that means unless we're able to use our own experience as an analog? Of course, we use the Bible. I'm not denying that either. We, we use both. But who, a computer can read the Bible, but a computer doesn't know what love means. Only humans can know. Maybe dogs. I don't know, depending on how much a dog person you are. Um, so if love is created, if other, and other feelings were created, were they fallen in Adam? Answer, yes. They were twisted and fallen in Adam. This is real compressed. Were they there? Can they therefore, and are they redeemed in Christ? bent back to their original intent? The answer is yes. So when the New Testament gives its highest command, it's, it doesn't say, know the Lord with all your mind. It doesn't say, obey the Lord with all your will. Although those are all true. Good, do those things. It says, love the Lord with all your heart. I hear feeling there. And if the counselor says to the counselee, it doesn't matter how you feel. You do what is right for your your wife. And maybe the feelings will follow, maybe they won't. That's wrong. That actually may be part of good advice when, when doing the right things for somebody are a step towards stoking your feelings for them again. But we never want to let someone get away with disobeying the command to love their neighbor as themselves. They are called, as we all are, ultimately to perfect obedience. Should we be discouraged when we're not perfectly obedient? Well, sometimes we should. Uh, Largely recognize we're not perfectly obedient in any area of our lives. That That doesn't mean we lower the bar and change the ideal. It means we it means we go to the Lord and we say, Lord, I am not loving my wife with the true love of delight that I vowed to love her with at our wedding. Please forgive me for my sin and restore me to the feelings I ought to have. Doesn't mean I'd have to recover the puppy love I had at age 17. But you know, if you're a mature man, what, it, what it's really like to really love your wife. And that's a command of God to retain. And like all other sins, we confess it and forsake it when we've, when we've broken it. Okay, hope you find that helpful. And I will try to get this up on Kindle Direct Publishing as soon as possible. Excellent. Um, thank you. 
I'm thinking as far as typically we've had a quiz at the end of our time. And what I am thinking here is that I will just put in all of the biblical, biblical references for both agapao or the agapao word group and the biblical references for the phileo word group. Um, I feel this very often in these kinds of discussions. People will have a lot of discussion about what's going on and you never read the passages. Right? And the best way to, to recognize usage is just read the passages. So putting that in, actually, when you read through them attentively, the, you're practicing lexicography. You're doing this. And in the process, I think it's the most persuasive thing because you're just reading what it says, okay? So I'm gonna put that in as our assignment for this quiz in place of a quiz. And uh, it's the kind of thing I hope could be devotional as well. Read attentively, read lexic lexicographically, but in the process, um, you can read devotionally as well because you're reading through a long list of verses that are, that are showing you the attitude that we ought to have. In other cases, people that have love for things they ought not to have. Um, so anyway, that was what you'll see. I'll get that up within the next like 15 minutes or something. I'll just paste that in there. You can pull those references out and go for that. And then it, there will be a quiz. You'll see a quiz. All it's going to have in the quiz is one, did you finish the reading? Two, did you read through these references? That's it. Okay. Um, and it's just a check that you just did those. Okay. Uh, looking forward to our class on Thursday. I'm just some thoughts I'm looking forward to sharing with you all. You will see the, re re the pre-class readings for that up within the next 24 hours and uh, looking forward to sharing with you more on that at that time on that day. If there are any other questions or any other comments, uh, let me know and just get in contact with me. Dr. Ward, thank you. Thank you very much for all your work these last multiple lectures and I hope you get some great sleep going forward here on a normal schedule. Okay, thank you to you all. Have a great day.